I'm George Siegel, and this is the Move the World podcast. Every week, we feature interviews with people dedicated to making the world a better place. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Move the World podcast. Every week, we try to introduce you to people who, in their lives or in their job, are doing something to move the world. And I have a guest today who uh, is doing quite a bit to move the world. I think you're really going to enjoy her. Suzanne Ryman Parker is the founder and CEO of a very unique little bakery in San Antonio, Texas. As a personal trainer and fitness enthusiast, she's also a registered dietitian with a mission to show the world that healthy can taste amazing. Suzanne, thanks for joining us. Such a treat to be here, George. Thanks for having me. Oh, it, it, it's my pleasure because when, when I found out about what you do, it's like it called out to me because I, I don't know a lot of people that, that eat like I try to. I'm a gluten-free, dairy-free. Um, oh, and so I saw your website and I go, where the heck was that place when I was in San Antonio? I would be living at your bakery, literally camped outside. Oh, I love to hear that. I always feel like I'm a little before my time. So darn, I'm sorry that I missed you. And with some luck, maybe I'll get a, a place in Florida too. Yeah, my story is being a little after my time. So <laughs> we kind of have it opposite. Great ideas after the fact. So if you were talking to somebody and they said, Suzanne, what do you do to move the world? What would you tell them? Gosh, you know, I feel like, George, it's true that I, I have been a little before my time. And that's because as a registered dietitian, I always believed that fitness centers were missing a really important piece. And that was, wow, if you want somebody to get healthy, you can't just tell them to go to the gym. They have to actually learn how to eat better. And uh, I'm not a typical dietitian because I started out as a, a fitness enthusiast. And then I figured, you know, I better add some nutrition as well. And um, what really is different about what I do is I try to apply nutrition in a way that really meets the consumer where they are. So um, now fast forward so many years in, in my career, um, my goal is to help other dietitians do the same uh, paradigm shift. And that is to really apply nutrition and fitness for everyday life and each chapter of our lives. Now, I read this book years ago because I was told I had a ton of inflammation in my body and I was eating terribly. It was called wheat belly. And it just was about all the bad stuff we put in our body and all the, all the things that we do because that's in all the food that we eat. So I went to somebody who completely changed my diet. But the problem is when you go to buy that food, a lot of times the things they put in it make it worse than what you were eating before. So what's the secret to doing this properly so you're actually getting a benefit from it? Yeah, gosh, I'm so glad you brought that up. So the whole reason I started Powerhouse Bakery, it was sort of a segue from my consulting business, Nutrition Matters. And when I used to work for HEB, I was their health and wellness director and really trying to decipher how this lifestyle evolution of eating is going to be applicable. So how do we help the you know consumer at the grocery store purchase foods? And so this gluten-free aisle shows up and, you know, they want me to help people understand why to pick gluten-free and it lives under this halo of healthy. And as you look a little deeper, you realize that gosh, the gluten-free foods on the market are not healthy. They happen to be free of gluten. So that's fine if you have a gluten allergy, but they're also free of really key nutritional components. So missing protein, minerals, um, essential fats that, you know, so often are a part of the wheat products. So, you know, yes, there's a whole conversation around what we've done to, to ruin our, our wheat crops, but going to gluten-free did not mean healthy. So you're absolutely right that, you know, you, you have to really understand what you're looking for and what you want to avoid when you're picking healthy. Yeah. It seems like there's a, like tapioca starch seems to fill most of the things, palm oil, uh, just I, I look down the ingredients and I see all of a sudden there's 30 other things on there um, that are disgusting. I, I also remember years ago, I used to go into the HEB there all the time and say, can you make these uh, uh, rotisserie chickens healthier? Because they had 50 ingredients in them. And the guy, one day I went in there and there was just three ingredients, but the third one said other ingredients. It was the same 30 things. They just put it under one heading. It's like, why, if we know how to do this, why aren't we doing it? That's my question. 
sauce, George. I tell you, you know, so when I start a powerhouse, um, taking out wheat, I put my food science hat on because that's really where I love to just play in the kitchen and learn about food technology in a way that makes sense for people. I mean, if, if it's not going to taste good, we're not going to eat it. So when I developed the flour blends, I said, how do we do three really important things? One, it's got to be free of gluten if we're going to address that population that, you know, wants to maybe avoid allergens. So make it free of gluten. It's got to taste good and it's got to be a nutritionally sound choice that is just hopefully as good perhaps even better for this person that has an allergy. We've got to improve their immune system with food. We've got to give them the minerals and the healthy proteins and fats they need. So when we create a alternative, it's got to be better. So then I went into the, um, you know, my kitchen and here in, um, in Bernie, and I tried to figure out what different flowers we needed. So I started with high protein and minerals. So that then I, I really geared towards uh, quinoa and coconut flour, uh, brown rice in some cases, but um, hazelnut meal so that we could get these minerals. And it started to just really take off because now we've got the all three components, uh, great texture, great flavor and great nutrition. Yeah, it seems like a lot of places throw up the sign. I mean, in uh, in Tampa, where I live, healthier places are starting to pop up. But when you go in and you ask them what's in it, they always say, well, we're waiting for corporate to tell us. We are going to find out. And I said, how do you open a business where you're telling people you're healthy, but you can't tell me what's in it and you have to ask corporate? Shouldn't corporate have told you that before right. you opened the door? It just drives me nuts. Well, and again, because so much of the food industry has um, so a low, such a low barrier to entry. So gluten free became popular because people thought, oh, that's an alternative to, you know, wheat belly. It's an alternative to avoiding inflammation. And, you know, of course, celiac patients knew all along there was something wrong with uh, certain foods. So the food industry jumps on the bandwagon, does something really quick. Heck, when I started Paros, I didn't even know about tapioca starch and and uh, all the white rice flours. Those were the ones I, I didn't want. I wanted nutrient rich. So the food industry goes for the easiest approach. And so white starchy texture is a low hanging fruit. It's very easy to use and it's very cheap. And so when the big companies jump in there, they don't want to think of how do we really build um, a value. We just want to get in there quick, make a quick buck. And, and that's truly what I didn't want to do with Powerhouse. So it's taken us eight years, but we have some amazing products that are thoroughly tested and do not have the white, starchy, uh, low nutrient quality. Yeah, the other thing I noticed too, a lot of these healthy, alleged healthy places, when they have something gluten-free, it's usually macaroons. And I always <laughs> say to them, what makes you think gluten-free people like macaroons? I go, are people just dying for macaroons? And that's like the easiest thing you could make. But how about a healthy chocolate chip cookie? How about a healthy brownie? Anything but a freaking macaroon. And that's Gosh. all they have. It's, it's well, it takes time to really learn about how to combine textures. I mean, let's face it, gluten in wheat is a very fabulous texture. The chewiness, the, the mouth feel, not to mention the protein is, is a great setup. I mean, that's why it's lasted for thousands of years in our, in our food industry. And sadly, as we have evolved and we expect um, mass production, we want cheap ingredients. So what does the food industry do? They figure out how to make wheat um, cheaply. And so now we've got this, this product that has caused an allergy or an aller uh, a response that's an allergy for a lot of people. And so now we've got to backtrack and figure out how to reinvent those great food textures with alternative grains. Yeah, and it seems like um, when uh, if you eat, try to eat gluten-free, there's, ne there's never much fiber in any of those dishes either. So you've, you're giving up something that you probably need because it's not in anything that you're eating. Yeah, that's such a good point. And, and so what we've done at Powerhouse is we have multiple 
uh, flour types. And so we have one that's for bread. We have one that's for muffins. Um, we have a sweet potato brownie that doesn't have any grain at all. It just uses sweet potato. Um, I love using alternatives. There's a product on the market that, you know, has been around for a long time and it, it might have made it all the way to Florida. It's a brand called Food for Life. And um, it has the Ezekiel bread, which is uh, one that a lot of folks know. It does have some wheat in it, but I bring it up because it again was a product kind of before its time and now it's really taken off. Um, the Food for Life company started in a little town in California where I grew up, Petaluma, California, and now it's you know nationwide, but it uses multiple grains that are sprouted and that becomes a really great alternative for folks. So I use that same idea at Powerhouse Bakery. So we have a a grain-free, a yeast-free uh, bun that is great for folks that need low carb. It has psyllium, it has almond flour, it has egg. So it has a great texture, but it works for folks that need to have no carbs at all. So we really have to have a nice variety so that people can, again, add healthy variety to their diet. Now, when we talk about moving the world, doing it through nutrition seems like such an important way, especially with uh, COVID and, and the people that seem to be very vulnerable to it. A lot of them s seem to have some weight challenges at times. You, and it, it's yeah. almost like we're so PC in the world, you can't really talk about that, but it is a problem. So how important is it for people to really dial into this better type of eating? Great, great point. You know, honestly, I feel like Americans have lost sight of some really important issues, baseline issues. What is ideal body weight. Um, you know, usual body weight, or we'll say average body weight has gone up so much that now if we see someone in their ideal body weight range, we think, heck, they're too thin <laughs> or something's wrong with them. Um, and that's so far from the truth. So we've lost sight of what is a healthy body weight. And that's um, really because we've lost sight of what is an ideal portion size. I tell you, there's so many mistakes that we dietitians have made. For example, if somebody comes to me and says, I need a, a meal plan and they have used my fitness pal in the past and my fitness pal has this algorithm and they says, okay, put in your height and your weight and maybe some exercise or activity factor in it. And it kicks out this very large number. Um, even if you go and get your body weight, uh, or your body mass, assessed. I had a lady come in yesterday. She had a document that said, look, I have uh, this resting metabolic rate and it tells me I need 2020 calories if I want to put on muscle. And here's a, you know, 56 year old woman that has too much body mass on her. And she's like, but I'm following this regulation. It's telling me I need to have 2000 calories and I need 125 grams of protein. Why is this not working? But the reality is those algorithms are vague at best. They forget that the human body has so many variabilities. And so the science brain in me says, okay, if you're doing this and it's not working, let's throw that out. Let's take that out and go back to ground zero. Let's learn hunger. Let's learn the normal body response of hunger and satiety. And most people don't even know what that means. They, they don't they haven't felt hunger in so long that they think it's a medical emergency if their stomach's growling. <laughs> and so I try to teach them that hunger is, is okay. One of the things that I think really helped uh, in the, you know, the last few years as far as diets uh, that people follow this intermittent fasting, the best thing that taught us is that we will not die if we wait 18 hours to put food in our system. And I thought that's the one good thing that's come out of that diet. Well, explain this to me then. There's a lot of places that do the pre-made meals where you go in, so you're buying a fixed amount. But if I make that recipe at home, maybe I'll have seconds, maybe I'll have thirds. So it's such a difference in how you eat. So when my wife and I get the pre-made meals, okay, it's healthier, maybe lacking flavor in some of these places, but we're starving afterwards because you have that one serving. I mean, they're giving you the amount that you probably should be eating. So how do you adjust to, to deal with that? Yeah. So our meals at Paris Bakery are all around 400 calories. Um, so I'll have, you know, six foot guys, big muscle dudes that come in and say, oh my gosh, that's not going to be enough food. And so part of it is I say, try it. You might be surprised because we do complex carbohydrates. Right now, Americans are so afraid of carbohydrates that the meal prep companies will give them protein and veggie. 
Of course, that's not going to be satisfying. We need complex carbohydrates. We need to get rid of the fear factor around carbs. Potatoes, rice, beans are all very good and very important foods in our, in our diet. So we need to bring those back in. The second part is even a, a guy that has a higher calorie need than a you know, five foot woman, um, we can start with a similar portion size and then we add things to it. For example, adding an extra salad or a little bit extra protein or carbs. I don't say just pile on the protein, I say, let's make the whole meal a little larger. And now let's add a snack. Uh, nuts and seeds are something that's been really left out of our typical eating pattern. And they are loaded with nutrients, not only good satiety factor in nuts and seeds, but the minerals that so many Americans are missing, that if we add those in, our metabolism and our, our overall body function is so much improved that then people start feeling better really on, on less calories and less fluff calories. So is, if I keep going back, like if I make something at home, I followed one of your recipes or something and I made this dish. If I'm going back for seconds or thirds, I'm really blowing it, right? I, I should stop after having the amount that I should have. And maybe it's okay to walk away and, and, and have that tomorrow as opposed to continuing to eat. What I always tell my clients is um, if you're feeling like you're still hungry after a meal, um, first wait 10 minutes and you can always go back for more because it is a realignment. It's, it's getting better acquainted with your body cues. I always believe in intuitive eating style. And that means that we can't be so rigorous about portions. Portions are going to vary for people. So one thing that the dietetic uh, um, profession is good at is teaching how to learn portions. So, you know, you might've heard of the fist and the palm. Those are good guides. So if your fist and palm is, you know, what you're going to start with, chances are they're larger than mine. That matches your body type. And so that's a good starting point. The second part of it is, yeah, we've got to relearn what it means to feel comfortable rather than full or even stuffed. If that's what we're going for, then we're probably going to feel like we need more or seconds and thirds, but we might just find that one more scoop or maybe an extra uh, scoop of salad will be enough to keep us feeling comfortable. And now we've got better energy and our body works better because in fact, we've given it less food. Well, when you look at that food pyramid or, or talk to people and they say, you need seven servings of vegetables a day, what, what the heck is a serving? I mean, is the serving one piece of broccoli? Is it a, a pile of broccoli? I mean, what, how do you know? How does the average person know? Because I have no idea and I try to, to do it right. That's so true, especially when it comes to greens. I mean, to your point, okay, is one sprig gonna count? So I always err on the generous side when we're going with vegetables. So on our plate, you know, now they're doing the plate instead of the pyramid. And thank goodness, because the pyramid did not have any um, understanding around it. So, okay, now we're at the, pyramid. the right? It's crazy. Yeah. And for a while, I said, oh, you can have six or 11 servings of the carbohydrate category. And people thought, cool, I'm going to have six slices of bread today, um, which of course is not what was intended. So a serving, let's just say for science, is going to be around a half a cup to a cup. We'll just use that as our ballpark. But again, I use my fist. So if I do a fist of potato, that's going to be, I don't know, probably about half a cup. And then if I want my veggies, I'm going to do two. So two fists, so a nice big handful. And it's a lot harder to err on the too much side when you're doing greens. It's, um, it's a different story when we're looking at the, the nutrient concentrated foods like fats and proteins. So again, air on the smaller side, a five ounce or a six ounce or even a two or three ounce of the lean muscle meat. And that's a good starting point. So again, I want us to not live on uh, portion sizes, but again, we want to live with how our body cues are guiding us. Now, another problem, I see it in my kids and I definitely see it in me. If I try to eat less during the day, right around five or six o'clock before dinner, I'm starving. And that's usually when I'm grabbing chips or other, other crap. And then when my kids come home from school, they'll stuff themselves for about an hour. And that's generally before dinner as well. So when you have that sudden hunger urge come on, because you've been running around all day, what's the best way to, to tamp that down? Water and nuts and seeds. So often if I get a client that complains, just like you have that, gosh, I'm so hungry in the afternoon. Um, I look at, did they get enough fat 
in their breakfast and their lunch. So fat definitely needs to be adequate in there. So, you know, say we look at a typical breakfast um, and as a side there, if, if your viewers or if yourself, if you haven't seen the that sugar film or um, the game changer, these are some really cool shows that talk about this exact question. You know, how do we eat healthy and not go overboard on the wrong things? So the the that sugar film shows a typical breakfast. Uh, sadly, it's very high in sugar, uh, refined sugar. If you pick a yogurt and you pick a breakfast cereal and milk or, and some orange juice, those items are loaded with sugar and they're too low in healthy grains and fats. So if somebody complains that they're too hungry in the afternoon, the first thing I do is look at what kinds of things are you picking first thing in the morning, mid morning and lunch. I would add in complex carbs. Um, so again, that Ezekiel product, if you don't have a powerhouse bakery nearby, to get um, nuts and grains and a little bit of protein. And then we move through the day and make sure you've got plenty of leafy greens, um, introducing things like lentils and quinoa that if you looked at the label, you might shy away from because it's going to have 45 grams of carbs in a, you know, a hearty serving. But I want you to put those in because during the day, you absolutely need those complex carbs. Now, another thing, answer this for me. There's a lot of places that are opening up that have those, I think it's pronounced acai bowls where you get the acai and then you get the fruit and all the stuff they put in it. By the time it's done, there's probably 60, 70 grams of sugar in that thing. And, yeah. and they don't want to tell you that in the store. And I'll, they'll say, oh, it's all natural sugar. If I'm stuffing my face with 60 grams of any kind of sugar, is that a bad thing or, or, or is it okay? It's a bad thing every which way you look at it. It's very similar. Now I'm going to lose popularity here, but it's very similar to a protein shake or a smoothie or juicing. Now, granted, for some people, that is a step in the right direction. If they're eating you know, fast food or they're not eating at all, Sure, those are things that you can start with, but we do not want to keep a protein shake and a smoothie and juices in our diet as we keep moving the needle in our healthy choices because of exactly what you said. They are too high in sugar, not enough fiber, and we really know that if we chew our food, the whole satiety factor and the improved metabolism is where it starts. Chewing food is absolutely important. And so the acai bowl is kind of like the protein shake in the smoothie. It's kind of gimmicky because of course it's gonna taste good. It gets to live under the healthy halo, but when you dig a little deeper and you understand what it means to have a healthy meal, it falls short. It's just like when you also, you go into Starbucks and you see somebody get that venti sugary drink with whipped cream on it at eight o'clock in the morning. And it's like, what are you doing? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, in, in favor of Starbucks, they do have a couple of good choices. I mean, they have really made an effort to make healthy fast food there. I mean, you can get black coffee, you can get awesome green tea, you can get uh, even the spinach and egg wrap is pretty good. Even the they sell little yogurts. Those are awesome. And now they're even trying to do the protein bowl where it'll have, you know, eggs and, and, you know, a little bit of cheese or whatever. So they're trying and I, and all fairness, they've, they've done a pretty good job with some choices, but of course, all around those choices are the ones that are really bad. And, and typically that's the, the first grab for the American. Yeah. I can't give them a pat on the back because when I go in there, there's very little, I, I say for my people because uh, my, the gluten-free people. They have very oh, little for us. True. Almost not nothing. Good. Yeah. Good point. And in fact, when I first opened Powerhouse Bakery, um, uh, a colleague of mine was actually providing all the bakery products. They're from San Antonio. And uh, I knew him because of my work with HEB. And I, I took him to lunch and I said, okay, I want to get these products in. Can you produce them for me in your you know, gigantic bakery? And first thing he said was, well, it's gluten-free. So no, because I'm not going to take out my other products. And then he said, they're not going to sell at Starbucks because nobody wants healthy. They want yummy. And was so, that Steve or David? Was that one of those, those guys? Was, oh, yeah, Who, exactly. Yeah. Cause I did a video for them years ago and uh, that was before I was gluten-free and it was fascinating how they made the food for Starbucks. And they had this machine that cut off the ends of the, um, the bread, the, the, the cakes. 
the stumps, I guess you would call them. That's my favorite part, but they just threw those out because nobody wants the stumps. It's like cutting off the crust of bread. I mean, now you can buy crustless bread at HEB. <laughs> I know, it's insane. Those guys were great though. So, all right. So obviously for somebody like me, who's nowhere near where you are, you don't ship, do you? You got to be there to you go do. into the bakery. You yeah. do? Uh huh. In fact, COVID really taught us that we need to get our website much more user friendly for shipping. Um, you know, actually, when I opened Powers Bakery eight years ago, all I was going to do was manufacture a product to sell at HEB. And what I realized, George, is that our products need more education because if HEB's goal is to um, always be a price win and my products are still expensive to make. I, I hardly make any profit on my bakery items versus a typical break bakery has very high profit. Uh, how would I live next to uh, Little Debbie's or um, you know other products even if they were in the freezer? So that's why I decided to pull back and just have my brick and mortar for a while to really get our name out there and, and help the or watch the industry start to have more healthy products available. And so I think we're close. I think we're there. Um, and we definitely want to try to ship more and, and have that piece of our business more effective. So do you, if you were shipping something to, to Florida, say to my house, for example, I mean, do you have to freeze it first and then pack it frozen? Because doesn't it, healthy stuff like that, because it's missing all those preservatives, how does it hold up if you're shipping it? You know, if we do, uh, so our products were all tested by an outside lab and um, we wanted to learn that. I mean, you know, just coming into the manufacturing industry, I wanted to figure out all those pieces. And so uh, our products are tested and they do very well shelf stable. Um, they, most of the products have a 30 day shelf life, um, not in the refrigerator. Now I have shipped things all over. And um, what we do is the, the product is fresh that day and we do the two day shipping and it makes it to its location in beautiful condition. I did try the freezer packs and the dry ice, but it's so expensive. I just couldn't make that work in our business model. So um, some of the products we don't ship, but a lot of them just, they do great. Yeah, I mean, it's really hot in the summer. So I imagine that makes it more challenging. And also, um, you know, I've tried businesses where you ship stuff and there's a lot of things break, things disappear. And now the, the post office came out and said it's going to take longer to ship things. I hope they're still going to do two day. I know it's been a real tough thing. I mean, um, we we do small boxes and we do the products that we're most confident in. So the Parker bars, all the cookies, the muffins um, work great. And again, when we first started, we were partnering with a, a juice shop. And so there was one in Frisco that we would uh, ship to. And granted, that's not Florida, um, but it, it worked great. I mean, they got their product in good condition. Um, a couple of times we've shipped um, muffins that got jostled. So we're learning how to package them better. But you know, it's it's always a learning curve because really our favorite customer is somebody that walks up looking for a healthy bakery and is, you know, blown away by all the choices they have. And, um, you know, really my dream fast forward is to get more dietitians um, that sort of have the mentality that I do that we need to be shoulder to shoulder with our customer, not just give them macros and calories. We need to teach them what a healthy diet looks like and what it tastes like and help them see that mainstream is probably not going to be their their ticket to wellness that they have to be a little more creative and a little better um investigator to find out what ingredients are best for their bodies so now uh, so a good start for people if they go to your website tell us the website and and what kind of great things we can find on there yeah so powerhousebakery.com um they can go to the the bakery products that are shippable. And um, we've got granolas that are nothing like you've ever tasted. You know, when you mentioned meal prep that don't have very much flavor, we are known for our spices. I created my own spice blends. We've got six now that are on the market. So those ship. Um, we've got all those spice blends that we use in our products. For example, the Brazilian granola has fresh ground cardamom, fresh uh, citrus that we squeeze 18 lemons to get. And I'm telling you, they are, it's, it's a granola that you'll never experience anywhere else. Uh, our going nuts in the tub is a granola that is all nuts. So for those that really are hardcore, low carb lovers, um, the only carbs that you get in that product are from organic cherries and organic cherry juice. So again, a really good product. 
So starting with uh, Powerhouse Bakery website, going to the bakery items, and then looking at some of our pictures, we've got a vibrant um, social media for Facebook as well as Instagram that kind of gets you excited about the products that we have. And um, heck, we're excited to try to ship and really help the con consumer and our customer um, get the products that they absolutely love. Now with all the prepaid, uh pre-prepared meals that you have on there. Are, are there recipes for people that want to try to emulate some of that and make it um, on, on their own? So if they want to try to just start eating better and follow your path. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. So um, we have a great YouTube channel. We've got all kinds of um, 30 minute cooking videos. Um, and now this was work I did with ThriveWell. So I'm very involved in the anti-cancer way of life. A lot of the clients that I work with that physicians send me are people that are serious about getting healthy. Um, they're in different stages of you know the cancer continuum um, and so those videos on YouTube, they can find at thrivewell.org or Powerhouse Bakery, the YouTube channel. And then um, also I have Pinterest recipes. Um, they can also schedule a Zoom cooking class with me. Before COVID, we had cooking classes live and it was so much fun and very different because the goal is that people learn how to play in the kitchen. They can be their own science scientist when it comes to flavors that really jazz up their palate. So on the, the, the private Zoom cooking classes that I offer, we get a group together on their side and me, and we have fun in the kitchen. We talk about spices. We talk about how to cook items that uh, are on their best foods list. So now the, the consulting business that I have starts off with teaching somebody how to develop their best foods. And then one of those visits, uh, one of the four can be in the kitchen. So I really help them learn how to do some of the new cooking styles that we talk about. Now, obviously, since you do this for a living, you, you have to have some optimistic approach. I mean, you, you, you have such enthusiasm that it, it, it's infectious, but do you see people really turning it around in how they eat? Do you think um, obesity or unhealthy eating styles can really change or some people that's just the way you know there's people that still smoke like crazy we can't we can't get to everybody you know it's so interesting George um, I I get clients that come to me with enthusiasm and are ready to go and they realize that they is harder than they thought and so again my job as their coach is to break it down small changes are much easier to incorporate and really become a part of their lifestyle. So when I read that in somebody, we do dial back and say, let's start small. Let's just focus on one element. Maybe it's getting more veggies in. Maybe it is going with a smoothie versus a, you know, their love of soda. Um, so it really is my job to make that work for the client. Um, and if I've done a good job, they are able to move it forward. But another misnomer that we have is that hmm, weight loss is easy. All I have to do is white knuckle this program and I'm going to come out in a month and be perfect. And I remind them that it's probably taken you more than a few years to get where you are. And our habits are so ingrained. I mean, we've, we've been grown, um, raised on eating styles and favorite foods. So it's going to take some time. And so getting a realistic expectation of what this transformation is gonna look like and, and really evolve is really the, the most critical part. The people that have done the best with me are ones that are also willing to do other reading on their own and learning about how to change habits. For example, The Atomic Habits is a book I love to recommend um, because it helps people look at what am I doing subconsciously that is contributing to my healthy habits. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're such an instant gratification society that people think I can lose all this weight in a week and then it's going to stay off. I mean, you really have to be committed to changing. Yes, changing and understanding that sometimes change is uncomfortable and we have to use different self-talk. And that is that, okay, I feel kind of hungry, but you know, it feels kind of good. I can drink water. I feel light. I like the fact that my, my gut's not hanging over my pants after I eat. You know, it's, you have to do different self-talk versus, oh man, I don't get to have ice cream anymore. That really sucks. Poor me. <laughs> and oh. so learning that, you know, there's some great things that you can give up. 
avoid that diabetic coma at, uh, at all costs. I mean, it's such a crummy feeling. So what advice would you have for somebody who has an idea or a thought and, and they want to try to do something to move the world? What would you tell them? Honestly, I think it's to find your passion, find something that you really believe in. I don't sell powerhouse bakery. I live it. And I love anytime I'm somewhere and, you know, food is kind of a fun topic because everybody can relate. And so I, I love to share that healthy is something that evolves in our whole life continuum. You know, I'm, I'm in the chapter of my life where people are you know, expecting that in your fifties as a female, especially you're going to get fat. And I'm like, no, you do not have to get fat. <laughs> you have to think about how do you evolve your exercise style, your eating style, and be very aware of your body cues so that you don't let that happen. So when we find people that can really move the world, I, I think that when you are passionate about something, it is easy to be infectious to others and help to really move the world. And my hope and prayer, George, is that I can get a handful of new uh, dietitians that can do what I'm doing so that Powerhouse Bakery and this idea can be in lots of different areas of the country so that we're not just selling an acai bowl to make a quick buck, but instead we're investing in people. Um, and my love for Jesus has really been the catapult for me to love people in a way that is, is honest and full of integrity. Well, hey, thank, thank you for sharing uh, your enthusiasm and what you do. And you're going to start seeing some orders trickling in from Tampa, because now that I know that you deliver, I'm, I'm back on that website. Oh, I'm super excited, sir. I can't wait to, to work with you and make sure our product gets to you and, and helps to, to move the world in your world. Yeah, because I'm turning into a fat old slob. This has to change. I, and I, you know, it's just it's such a battle to to always try to eat well. So when you find things that are good that can also be good for you, I think that's pretty exciting. Well, and that's the thing. I always say never eat a food you don't love. And at the same time, we want to make sure that we fuel our body that's active. You know, sometimes when you have so much in your refrigerator, you know, sometimes I hear parents say, well, you know, the kids can have it. And I'm like, wait a minute, just because you're a kid doesn't mean you should eat junk food. A kid is growing. They have even more interest in super healthy. And so creating insurance in your environment means that anything in your fridge is good for family. And so really making that mindset means that having healthy foods and you change your palate makes it a whole lot easier to uh, go through the life stages and not uh, let those extra calories sneak up on our hips. Yeah, good. Great, great goal. And with kids, I mean, it's a losing battle because this anybody with kids knows it's tough I, to it, get them to eat well. Kids. What's that? How old are your kids? Um, the, 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 the two that live with me are 11 and 14 and, um, they just eat a lot of, a lot of crap. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, so I would love to send you some of our products and also some recipes so that you can wow their taste buds. You know, we humans have such an interesting palate. We have a love for salt and sweet, of course, and fat. That's what the food industry hones in on, number one. But we also have the nuances of bitter and umami, which is the, the meat flavor that can really be an interesting blend all through the flavor continuum. And then the love of texture variation and temperature variation does so much to make a meal satisfying and interesting. We don't need to go just for the low hanging fruit of high salt, high fat, and even crunch. I promise you, there's so many wonderful flavors in the world of spices that even some kids can be wowed. My boys are now grown and gone, but they loved the, the crazy things that I whipped up and, and now are serious health enthusiasts uh, in their adult life. That's awesome. I'm gonna have to take that a lot more seriously and, and, and take you up on that. Suzanne, thanks so, thanks so much for coming on. I love being here. Thank you, sir. All right, so that's going to do it for this uh, episode of the Move the World pod podcast. It'd be great if we could all do a better job eating. And uh, thanks to Suzanne and the work she does, that's certainly going to be uh, something that I'm going to check out in a lot more detail, and I hope you will too. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.